This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem is the plural of you. Peace be upon you all, right? Uh, Shalom Aleichem. And it's interesting, we say that to an individual as well. We use the plural. Same in Arabic, Salam Aleikum. Aleikum, the um at the end is a plural. And we're speaking to one person, yet we greet in the plural. The idea today that I understand from the readings, the various readings, is to get beyond our comfort zone from the I to the many, from the individual to the community, from the exclusive to the inclusive. You might say, how does a rabbi deal with texts other than the Psalms, which are part of our Jewish heritage as sacred writings, how might I find meaning in those? And I'd like to share with you those meanings, even if you didn't ask the question yourself. <laughs> we start with the story of Paul having a vision. And in that vision, Paul is told, get out of your comfort zone. Get in a boat and go someplace else. Go from Asia to Europe, not deep into Europe, but go, get in a boat and take your people and talk to the, this particular woman, Lydia. A wealthy woman, we're told, a merchant of a particular expensive kind of cloth. They find her and her people by the water, a place of purity, where they had a feeling there might be prayer happening. And she's not Jewish, it doesn't seem she's Jewish. And she's certainly not a disciple yet of Paul and a believer in Christ. But she does worship the one God. In other words, there's, a, there's an approach to someone who's pretty close. It's not a huge chasm in between Paul and his people and this woman and her family. And it seems like from the text, chick chuck, as we say in Israeli Hebrew. Chick chuck, she's converted. <laughs> and chick chuck, she's inviting them into her home. That's pretty cool. Paul leaves his space of comfort, his comfort zone, and it works. But then, and now I'm leaving the simple meaning of the text. I'd like to believe what I just said now is what we call in Hebrew the pshat, the simple meaning of the text. And now I go into the realm of midrash, which is the expansive. I go from exegesis to eisegesis, as you've probably heard before. And eisegesis is typically Jewish. And the more, the merrier. As I taught in the psalm class, we say the Torah has 70 faces. Shivim panim la Torah. There's 70 different possible interpretations, and believe me, it doesn't mean 70. It could be two or three, and it could be 973. The more, the merrier. Because the sacred text only has meaning if you're continuously expanding it and bringing it to a contemporary state. Still, as an academic, a former academic, I think it's important to know what the simple meaning of the text and then what the midrashic or the embellished meaning is. If I go to the embellished meaning of that particular text, in my words today, I imagine Paul saying to himself on the boat on the way back, was that the right thing to do? I have a truth that I know and so easily it went to the other person? A little bit suspicious, perhaps. Can it really be that easy? Is she really devoted to this new ideology, this new belief? And as if an answer from heaven comes the psalm, this grand psalm that emphasizes line after line, the earth, humanity, the entire, the whole thing. The ganzige shift, as we would say the big, the whole, the whole largeness of the world, of the cosmos already. That's the message of that psalm. It's an absolutely universalistic psalm. There's nothing particular about the Israelites, the Hebrews, the chosen people. It's all of earth, all of humanity. Not the priests, and not the prophets, and not the kings, and not the men. Everybody is in that psalm. As if God is telling Paul, I imagine in my own little eisegesis here, you did the right thing. 
the word needs to be spread to the entire world. Now, we don't necessarily need to agree exactly the details of that word, do we? But we do believe in good news. That's common to all of us. All humanity believes in the idea of good news and the word. We just disagree a little bit on what that word might be and what exactly that good news is. But a message for humanity that things could be better, that you and you and you can get better and will get better, a message of healing is true for all of us of all religions and all faith traditions. But now we get to the, the strange, the strange scripture, Revelation. Interesting book, strange book. But based on no less stranger Hebrew Bible books, Ezekiel and Daniel. And every chapter has a different part that it's, that it's based on. Our chapter, our little passage today, is based on Ezekiel. This whole second half of the book of Ezekiel is is a bizarre look at what the temple in Jerusalem will be like after the, sec the coming of the Jewish Messiah, when God returns God's people to the Holy Land. Ezekiel, as you probably know, was a prophet in the diaspora, in Babylonia. And the people were crushed. The temple was destroyed. That was their connection. The people didn't know anything else, at least the Judeans. All they knew of was that temple. In 586, it was destroyed, and these people, the aristocrats of the tribe of Judah, were brought a distance to the river Kvar, the banks of the river Kvar, in a place called Tel Aviv, hence the name of modern-day Israeli city. And there Ezekiel, first of all, makes it clear to them, don't think that you lost this temple because of sins of your parents. That's not the case. Each of you were judged individually. This generation was judged individually, and you lost the temple and your monarchy and everything that went with it because you did not act kindly. You did not act with purity towards God. You were idolatrous. That's the first half of the book, more or less in extremely visual, different ways, this prophet, very unique amongst the prophets. The second half of the book is, but don't worry, one day it will be rebuilt. And this idea, the blueprint for rebuilding, has nothing to do with reality. So it wasn't written ex eventum, afterwards, looking back, like many of our prophecies are. It was a prophecy that really was an idea, a fantasy of what that world would look like. And in that world, Ezekiel, who's a priest, the priests are at the top the way they should be, according to the priestly parts of, the, of Scripture. The, no, not you priests. No, no. The children, the sons of Aaron, and the tribes are, 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 are organized in a very loud, they're all straight lines, it's like a striped map of the land of Israel. It's a strange, strange book. And here are Revelations has a play on it, it's a riff on it, it's an improvisation. It's like a jazz improvisation on the earlier scripture. And in Revelation, suddenly, Jerusalem is back in its splendor. There's light, there's water flowing that gives light, water. There was a river flowing in, in Macedonia as well, and there's a river here. But this river is a magical or a super, supernatural river. And there is no need for the sun or the moon or any light because light is emanating from Jerusalem. Except for, there ain't no temple. This is a vision without the temple. In the priestly way of looking at things, Ezekiel's way of looking at things, there is a gradual layer, or there are gradual layers of concentric circles. It was formulated hundreds of years later by the rabbis of the Talmud around the year 200, when the corpus that we call the Mishnah was edited in northern Israel. And in that section that talks about um, purity and impurity and holiness and the lack of holiness, it divides the world into 10 degrees of concentric circles. If I had a board, I would write a big circle right up here, and I'd say, that is the world. That's the earth. And then the next circle would be, according to the Mishnah, the land of Israel, the Holy Land. And the next circle under that would be Jerusalem. 
And the next circle under that would be the Temple Mount. And the next circle would be on the inside of the walls of the temple. And the next one would be the area where everybody could go to, including non-Jews. The next one would be where only men could go to, no Jews or no women. The next one would be where the Levites can go as well, and the, and the priests, so on and so forth, until you get to the tiny little circle in the middle, which is the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And only one man could go there once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and that was the chief priest. One day, once a year, one man. That's exclusive. It's almost ha 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 exclusive. <laughs> I'm in and you're out. And that was thought to be the epitome of holiness. Exclusivity. The farther you are from the inner circle, the less holy you are. And as in my own eisegesis, I go back and I hear the voice telling Paul, get out of your comfort zone. Your little band of people that you hang out with geographically. You know Paul is the great evangelist who goes out and spreads the word. But at a certain time, in the beginning, he's in the close proximity of where he lived. And he goes out to spread the word to be inclusive and not exclusive. Geographically outside of the land of Israel. And the psalm says, it's not just outside the land of Israel, it's the entire earth. The entire earth is holy, and the entire earth needs to praise God for the gifts that God has given to this earth. And then comes our story in the Gospels. Hmm. There's water again, just like previous two passages. This time the water is a strange water, and it depends which of the ancient manuscripts you want to go with. The text, as we have here, has the water that was stirred. A little bit peculiar, unless you've studied this before. What difference did it make if the man went in the bath, whether the water was stirred? What does that mean, stirred? Like somebody had a big stir? When I first read it, that's what I thought. That they, but why would they do that? Usually you want the water to settle so that the, the muck goes to the bottom, right? Interesting enough, where did this happen? Here you have Beit Saida, but that's somewhere else. That's in the Galilee, Beit Saida. Um, the Greek has been interpreted in many different ways. I grew up knowing the place in Jerusalem as based on Beit Chizda, the Aramaic form of mercy. And I guess his story would be that this is where Jesus had mercy on this sick man, this ailing man, this invalid, and cured him. But when you look closer, as philologists have done, the most convincing argument that I saw in the studies on this verse were, it should be Beit Eshda. And Eshed in Hebrew means the swirling of water, the white water in a stream that moves. And the belief was, I imagine, that's not me, but other scholars we imagine, is that the stirring, stirring, the stirring water is the water which heals, perhaps like hot bubbles coming up from a geothermal source. Although Jerusalem isn't famous for hot springs, but maybe it's the same idea, that the bubbling water is what heals, not the standing water. In some later manuscripts, it's the waters that have been stirred up by the angels, or an angel stirred up, and then we understand that's certainly healing water. And so... Here's a man who's a bit of a nebuch, we would say in Yiddish. He can't really get a hold of his situation. He's complaining, I'm never at this, I'm always pushed to the back of the line and I never get in and everybody else. And, and finally Jesus says, doesn't say get into the water. Doesn't make room for them. We would expect him to say, everybody, let's hold off. Let this guy go down to the water first. No. Jesus says, just get up and pick up your mat. Take it with you. And then the last line that we have here, which is a little misleading, is that, oh, by the way, it was the Sabbath. Well, if you read on in that chapter, you see, not by the way, it was the Sabbath. That was once again the Pharisees and the rabbinic leaders of the time saying, look at this guy, he's breaking the rules of the Sabbath again. Because on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to heal. Then you might ask yourself, why would you not heal on the Sabbath? A day of rest, isn't that healing in itself? Well, some people might say, well, that's what it is. The day heals, and if you heal on that day, then you're showing a lack of faith, a lack of belief. Let the day heal. Why should you do it? Of course, Jesus' answer in further generations is, well, 
Jesus says, it's not me, it's the Lord. The Lord is working through me. But the truth of the matter is, the opposition to healing on the Sabbath by the rabbis of the time wasn't about the healing. It was about worrying that people would take the, 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 the herbs and things and grind them. I'm, I'm doing, this is a mortar and pestle in my hand, in case you can't tell. We had one in the mantle when I was growing up. And, and, and grind, that grinding is not allowed to do on Sabbath. And so they were worried that if people went to talk about healing somebody, they would be grinding and then they'd be out. One way or another, Jesus is saying, that's not what's important. It's not the land of Israel, which is the holy space. It's not Jerusalem, the temple, which is the place of healing. It's not the, the palace in time, the Sabbath, which have the strength to do all this healing. It's being able to give the good word to the other. And it's not just when it's easy, like Lydia, who had the money and was already predisposed for this. And it's not easy like a fantasy in Revelation, because you can fantasize about whatever you want. It's down in the dirtiest part of the city, near the gate where the sheep came in that had to smell badly, in a pool that was crowded around by invalid people, by a person that doesn't even say thank you and that later on in the chapter doesn't even recognize Jesus when Jesus comes up to him and said, I was the one who healed you. The work of going out and being inclusive is not always easy. But that is what I believe the text today are teaching us. Thank you.